All right, welcome. Welcome. Um, so I'm going to give an introduction to Shep. Um, I'll talk a little bit about black holes myself. Um, so black hole is an object that has such intense gravity that nothing can escape. If you get within a certain distance of a black hole, if you cross over the event horizon, that's it. Nothing can come out, light can't come out, that's why they're black. Um, so you think that's pretty simple, right? A black hole, you know, it's just the blackest of all objects, there's not much going on. But black holes are actually much more complicated than that. Um, so one thing, so I'm going to tell you two interesting facts about black holes that I hope will impress you. Um, and one is that uh, although black holes are sort of the, the darkest of all objects, they actually they, they power the brightest objects in the universe, that is quasars. So they're the power source um, for these very bright objects. So, so the material that's close to a black hole gets pulled in, it gets heated up, gives off um, radiation along the way, gives off a lot of light, a lot of X-rays, a lot of optical light, um, to make these uh, very, very bright objects. Um, so quasars are so bright that you can see, see them basically across the universe, um, distances of over 10 billion, um, 10 billion light years. Um, so just to give uh, something of an idea of how bright quasars are, um, I've got a little analogy here to talk about, it's an equation of sorts, um, to talk about how, uh, how powerful quasars are, uh, how, much, how much energy they produce uh, per second. And so I've got a little, this is sort of like a question, and that is to compare uh, the, the amount of energy that a hydrogen, hydrogen bomb produces, and that's the, the, the most powerful explosion that we know of. So how much more energy uh, does a quasar produce than a hydrogen bomb? Is it, does a hydrogen bomb, uh, does a quasar produce, say, 10 times the energy of a hydrogen bomb? Or maybe 100 times, um, 1,000 times, a million times, um, or more? So how much more energy per day, per, per second, rather, does a quasar produce than a hydrogen bomb? Guesses? 10 to the 20th. <laughs> That's really close. So it's the, the answer is 10 to the 22. Um, <laughs> who knew that? <laughs> so um, so that's, uh, that's 10 billion trillion times the energy of a hydrogen bomb. And so, yeah, that's a lot of energy. And so uh, this, this was stolen from a colleague's talk, by the way, so in case he's watching, um, give him credit. Uh, so that's 10 to the 22, I'm told, is roughly the number of grains of sand on, on, on the earth, basically all the beaches, all the, the deserts. So that's a, that's a big number. So that's one fact about black holes. They produce a lot of light. Another interesting fact is that all the material that starts getting pulled towards the black hole isn't doomed. I mean, there's some material that goes in close to the event horizon that gets shot off in jets at uh, close to the speed of light. Um, so. I mean, that, that's sort of the ultimate in rejection, isn't it, to be rejected by a black hole. <laughs> you, you, you would think that nothing would be, yeah, the reject, black hole would reject nothing. Um, but um, that can happen. Um, so this uh, is a little sequence showing, you know, if you've got some glob of material that falls down towards the black hole, um, then you can get a jet produced, and then, um, you know, the jet sort of runs off into the distance, and then it fades. Um, so you can get sort of bursts from black holes as well. You can, some people call them burps. I'll mention that again in a second. So, so this is sort of putting together all of these pictures that I've shown you. And so I'd like to ask another question, and that is, what is in common between all of these pictures here, um, apart from it being about black holes in every case? Yeah? yeah? The light is being bent and all the pictures. That's a good point. That's right, there's lensing. So that's... Uh, I think it's happening. It's not happening in this one. Yeah, that one's, that one's sort of a cheat. So, so the thing that's in common amongst all of them is they're all artist impressions. These are all sort of imagination of, um, of artists. And they're based on, on, on real data, and they're probably quite accurate. They're not real pictures. Um, and that's something that uh, Shep is going to be talking about. So I need to talk a little bit about Chandra, because um, that's who I work for. Um, so over the, the years with Chandra, we've found you know, many, many black holes have found, um, you know, lots of quasars. And we've done, I don't know, dozens, maybe over 100 press releases uh, involving black holes. So that's a lot. Um, and, 
yeah, it, after, after some years I've been doing, for 15 years I've been doing um, publicity for, for Chandra, you sort of get a, a, the bar gets higher and higher for you know, getting something that's truly novel, that's truly uh, new. And that's a real challenge. I mean, it's really hard to do that. Um, and so it does get more difficult. Uh, so <laughs> this is a news story that we had. I mean, pe people can come to you and say, we've got another black hole result. Um, and I say, well, that's great. Um, you know, what's, what's different about this one? I mean, all black holes are exciting, but you know, the, the, the bar that we have is fairly high. Um, so yeah, this is a, yeah, people can come to us and say, yeah, we've got a, a black hole burp, um, you know, a belching black hole. Um, that's great. I mean, but we've done that story before. Um, and so what's better than one burp from a black hole? That's two burps from a black hole. Yeah. So, so, so this is like, this is at the same conference two years later. Uh, the, the, we went from one, one burp to two. Uh, so th these are just some pictures. So, so another thing that people might say is we've got this beautiful, beautiful image uh, that combines, say, radio and optical and x-rays. Um, showing uh, you know, jets from a black hole, um, you're making a pretty picture, but you know, we say we've got pictures like that. Um, yeah. You're just basically raising the bar each time about how, how beautiful the, the, the picture can be. So these are composite images with, with radio and Chandra, the black holes in the middle. I think these are really beautiful. So, um, so these, are, these are the three images I showed you. You can see the, you can see the jets, you can see X-ray emission um, and, and galaxies. Uh, so, the thing to sort of note when you look at these images is, I mean, the, the physical scale of these images is huge. It, it is much, much bigger than the event horizon of the black hole. I mean, the, the black hole event horizon is like a tiny, tiny pixel in the <laughs> tiny fraction of a pixel in the middle of uh, these images. Um, so, you know, what, what uh, Shep is trying to do what, with the event horizon telescope is to take an image of the event horizon. I mean, that, so I talked about having the, the publicity bar be high. I mean, if, if they succeed uh, in, in their endeavor, that will be not just sort of reaching that bar, that'll be like soaring over the bar, that'll be <laughs> going into low Earth orbit, that'll be, that'll be a really big deal. Um, so Shep, just briefly, um, he went to Reed College as an undergrad, and then he spent a year in Antarctic, which I think is quite brave, so that's, that's where you winter over, um, so you you get sick, <laughs> something bad happens, you're sort of stuck there. Um, and then he came back and uh, did a PhD at MIT, and then he went on to do um, a postdoc at Max Planck, which is in Europe. And then he came back, uh, was employed by MIT as a postdoc, and then he um, became, I think, was a program scientist at, at Haystack, project scientist. And then he got a joint position between MIT and CFA, um, and then now he's passed over to be, being completely a CFI scientist. So I guess you know, the, these two great institutions are a few miles apart that he decided that the CFI was just a little, a little bit better than MIT for uh, um, his, uh, you know, the work he wants to do. So I hand it over to Chuck. How do you top a burp? <laughs> we'll try to get there. So let's see, Is that, okay, so we're going to talk about seeing the unseeable. You know, when you think about black holes, and Peter gave a wonderful introduction to them, we all have some idea what black holes are, right? We've seen movies, right? We've maybe, who's, who saw Interstellar, right? A lot, a lot of people saw Interstellar, so we know what's in there, the bookcases inside <laughs> black holes, and, um, and love also is inside the black hole. Right? That's how you communicate love. But... We, we've seen them eat stars, you know, planets, you know, and not just real stars like our sun. We've seen them eat movie stars, right? So, like Bruce Willis is the kind of person that routinely falls into a black hole. And I haven't seen Bruce Willis in a while, so I figure maybe it's actually happened. Um, but, but black holes really are what Peter said. They are runaway gravity. They're when enough material gets in a small enough volume that nothing, no stiffness of matter, can prevent gravity from crushing what's inside to a point of infinite density. Okay? And what surrounds that point of infinite density is, again, what Peter said, the event horizon. That's where gravity is so strong that even light can't escape. And so it really is something that's unseeable. And the project that I'm going to talk to you about tonight is something that is dedicated to seeing 
what we've been told cannot be seen. Right? Nature creates this invisibility cloak around that singularity, and we are going to try to see you know, that, the, that, the innermost part of that cloak. Right? And if we could do that, then we could test Einstein's theory of gravity in the one place where it might break down. So Einstein's theory has been tested in our solar system, with tabletop experiments, and in a lot of different ways, but we haven't taken it to the ultimate proving ground. We haven't taken it to the edge of a black hole. And that's where you go if you are a dedicated astronomer, physicist, or doing anything, really. You want to go to the most extreme environments that you can. Okay? And that's where you test your theories. Right? So Newton's theory held sway for hundreds of years. And it was only when we started thinking deeply about gravity that we realized it was not explaining everything. And that Einstein's theory had to replace it. So let's get started. Uh, as, as, as Peter said, you've got these nice optical photographs of galaxies. This is a beautiful galaxy, kind of a run-of-the-mill galaxy. Every, all, all the light you see here is from stars. Okay, there's so many of them that it blends into this you know, kind of haze. And when you look at it in radio wavelengths, though, you see something extraordinary. You see this jet of material that, that Peter talked about. Now, this should really kind of terrify you a little bit, okay? a little terror. Right? Uh, it's very far away, so don't be scared of it. But the reason it should terrorize you is that it is hugely powerful. It's one of the most powerful phenomena in the universe. And we have no idea really what powers it. It could be hydrogen bombs that you know, Peter was telling us about. But hydrogen bombs don't answer the question, right? Because hydrogen bombs would give you a spherical blast wave, right? Unless you had some kind of containment vessel for 10 to the 22 hydrogen bombs. There has to be something directional here, right? And the only thing we can think of to power these jets, which travel tens of thousands of light years, they pierce an entire galaxy, is a spinning black hole, right? That's, a, that's accreting matter. Matter is falling so fast onto it at the speed of light that it crashes into all the matter that's come before it. And in a cosmic traffic jam, it heats up to hundreds of billions of degrees. The spinning black hole shoots that matter out from the North and South Pole. It's the only thing we can think of to do this. And what Peter didn't say is that this mechanism is much more efficient than a hydrogen bomb. A hydrogen bomb is maybe 1% or 2% efficient, maybe not even that. This can be up to 40% efficient. So it's an amazing way to convert matter into energy. So we're on the hunt to zoom in on this and see if we can see the engine that causes this. Now, I want to start by talking about this guy who in addition to being very smart, rocked an amazing mustache for most of his life, <laughs> Einstein. And he basically re-engineered gravity for us. He said, Newtonian gravity is great, but I want to make a geometric version of gravity. And think of a weight sinking into a rubber membrane and things moving around that rubber membrane. So matter distorts space-time, and other objects move through that distorted space-time. It's a completely different way of thinking about gravity. There was no force between objects. It was just matter moving along space-time. And the reason that you needed this was, for example, the fact that Mercury's orbit was unexplained. We, we think of orbits going around the sun, and it comes back right where it started. Mercury's orbit did not do that. Every time it went around the sun, it got a little kick. And it did one of these rose petal patterns here that you see. It never came back in on itself. And nobody could really explain that. When Einstein formulated his theory, he immediately explained that, right? As the, as the fact that there was a strong gravitational effect when Mercury went around the sun, okay? But revolutionizing gravity requires really important evidence, okay? And, and, but, the, but before I get into the evidence, I want to talk to you about this other guy who also has an amazing mustache. I think that's just how they rolled back then. <laughs> This is Schwarzschild, and he was in the trenches of World War I, computing with Newtonian gravity the trajectories of artillery shells. And he got word of Einstein's discovery. And he was no slouch himself. He was a very prominent physicist of his time. And in the trenches of World War I, he solved Einstein's equations for a point mass. He said, what if all the mass is in a little point? And he realized that there was this event horizon membrane, which we now know is one Schwarzschild radius away from the singularity. Right? It bears his name. And he said that sometimes gravity can be so punctured, it can be so strong here, 
you wind up with an event horizon here where light can't escape. Okay? And in 1919, Sir Arthur Eddington is part of the kind of adventure science that I personally love to do. That's why I went to Antarctica. Sent out two expeditions, one to Brazil and one off the coast of Africa to look at the total solar eclipse in 1919 because Einstein predicted that light should be bent around the sun due to gravity. So this is where the star actually is, but we see the star slightly shifted in its position here, right, because of the bending of, of light. And they found exactly this offset, exactly what Einstein predicted. And overnight, our entire concept of gravity was changed, and Einstein became a household word, and um, you know, many mothers and fathers said, why can't you be more like Einstein? You know, if, if this hadn't happened, it would be somebody else. It would be like Murgatroyd or some other, some other genius. Now, th th then, the, then the chase was on, right? Could matter actually collapse? Because even Einstein didn't think these black holes could exist. He thought there'd be some force that would keep matter from falling in on itself. And, and this is uh, Chandrasekhar, an Indian uh, physicist and astronomer, who, who, who realized that there were exotic examples of matter in the universe, right? So our sun is made of kind of normal matter, you know, atoms and, and, and electrons. But he realized that there was a star, uh, Sirius, that was a white dwarf. Imagine the mass of our sun compressed down into something the size of the Earth, okay? So, so now, you know, all of the space between the electron and the nucleus of the, of the atom is removed, right? So it's just kind of like electrons and a big soup all together. And the, the amazing thing about this is that the density is extraordinary. It's like 100 billion times what normal matter is. Okay, so we're getting close, but we're not to a black hole just yet. So a white dwarf is here, so our sun is gonna explode like this. We're gonna leave a beautiful corpse. It's gonna be the size of the Earth. But above about 1.4 solar masses, you can't even get white dwarf matter. It compresses even more, so you only have neutrons. Now it's like one gigantic nucleus. It's the densest material we know of. A teaspoon of it is trillions of tons, okay? And so the whole star compresses to the size of Boston, but even that isn't a black hole. But above about two to three solar masses, even the stiffness of neutronium, I can't believe I just said that, the stiffness of neutronium, like it's a real thing. Like you can go to Ace Hardware and get some neutronium, which you can't. But if you could, it would just collapse in on itself. There's too much material, and gravity is, is irresistible. No stiffness of that neutron material can prevent you from, from collapsing. Now, in addition to small black holes, which are born from supernovae and stars, right, there are also supermassive black holes. And since about the 1970s, we've realized that there are monsters out there. Right? The ones that are powering those jets that, that Peter talked about that I showed you are millions or billions times the mass of our sun. So black holes really are trap doors out of our universe. You open this trap door, you pack in a million or a billion suns, you close the trap door. And you wind up seeing these jets that we saw before. And when you look at the gas moving right around the black hole, you see on one side red-shifted gas, so it's moving away from you very, very quickly, like a Doppler effect. And on the, other side, on the other side, you see blue shifted gas. It's coming towards you. And so you realize that there's something moving and rotating around this center part of the galaxy. And there has to be a huge mass concentration in here. And you know, the, the, the cast of characters that we can choose from have to be only a supermassive black hole. So there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that these black holes do exist in the centers of galaxies, those jets, and also the gas dynamics here. Now I want to take a small aside and say that just a couple of years ago, there was an amazing discovery that really solidified the existence of black holes. Uh, in 1916, Einstein predicted gravitational waves. Okay, these are waves in which the space, the fabric of space-time moves in and out. And it only happens when very, very massive, very, very highly gravitational bodies interact. So if you have a pulsar or a dead star, one of those neutron stars I was telling you about orbiting, then you can wind up seeing the fact that the gravitational waves emanating from that star will rob energy from it, and the orbit will change over a long period of time. So when you have two of these things orbiting each other, and they happen in the universe, you can see that the period of the orbit will change, and that's exactly what people did 
um, in, in, in 1993, they saw the period of the orbit change as a function of time, and they won the Nobel Prize for this because it was the first indirect evidence that there was gravitational waves. And then, and you can see here the, the, what gravitational waves do to space-time, they actually bend it. So when a gravitational wave passes through you, your body is actually moving a little bit. So they decided to make what's called the, the, the LIGO detector, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. And they said, can we see these waves change the fabric of space-time after two black holes or two neutron stars merge? And in 2015, they saw exactly that. There were two sites, one in Louisiana and one in Washington. And they saw this, this waveform that indicated to them beyond a shadow of a doubt that two large black holes, not supermassive ones, but large black holes, had spiraled around each other and merged over a billion light years away. Okay, so what you're seeing here is you see the in-spiral here, and then you see this merging part, and then you see a ring down here. Right? So the characteristic signal, and you can almost think of this as hearing black holes, because this is all happening, as you'll see in this animation, this is all happening in the kilohertz range. It all happens within a second. So you see here you're only about half a second out from these two black holes merging. You're seeing the fabric of space-time distorted, and everything is happening in under half a second. Right? So You'll see here in a moment that these black holes are going to get closer and closer. And on the bottom here, you can see where we are in the waveform. For a long time, the waveform is at a certain frequency, you know, just uh, you know, in, in the audible range. That's what we call it, hearing a black hole. And when it gets to the very end here, it's going faster and faster. And you can see the fabric of space-time distorting. And then the moment of black hole animal husbandry. <laughs> Wham. And this ringing of space-time was heard over a billion years later here on Earth with those interferometers that I showed you a second ago. And when you pan up, you see the wave front of those gravitational waves emanating out into space. So we know that black holes almost definitely exist. This is what we used to know from X-ray studies, but with the LIGO mergers, we know there are black holes that are 60 to 50 times the mass of our sun. Okay. Now, if we want to go beyond hearing a black hole, if you want to see a black hole, then you have to figure out a way to observe them in the electromagnetic spectrum, right? the optical light that we see, or radio waves, something like that. So we have to ask ourselves, why do black holes glow? Well, all that material falling onto the black hole goes faster and faster and faster, so it takes the potential energy of the black hole, turns it into kinetic energy, and there's this cosmic traffic jam which causes all of that material to heat up to hundreds of billions of degrees. And as I said before, you can be 40% efficient, and near the black hole, it glows incredibly brightly. So in a paradox of its own gravity, black holes, as Peter mentioned, are some of the brightest objects in the universe. Okay, so they become very, very easy to see. Now, if you were to put on infinite resolution goggles, what would you really see? If you get up close and personal, if you were going to fall into a black hole, you and Bruce Willis together into the black hole, you would see something that we call the silhouette of the black hole. These are three different realizations of what theorists think you would see if you could be at a black hole. And even though there are some differences in the details, what you should really take away from this is there's this circle of light in all of these images, and that's the last photon orbit. That's where even light has to circularize around the black hole. Light, which is the fastest thing we know of, is forced into an orbit around the black hole. And when the light goes around and around and it circularizes, it lights up in a ring, that orbit, and that's what, we're, that's what we see here. And the interesting thing is that in 1915, Einstein's equations predicted the size and the shape of that silhouette. And if we could image that, we'd test Einstein's theory at the black hole boundary. Right? We would know that all the mass of the black hole has to be interior to that, and that the light we're seeing is moving around in just the way we think it should be moving around. Now, in addition to light, matter has to orbit in very special ways. Right? So matter is moving close to the speed of light, so your intuition kind of has to be cast aside 
the way matter orbits is a little bit different than we think. So black holes can spin. So if you have a zero spin black hole, you can orbit around here. And the distance of the innermost stable orbit, right, the orbit beyond which you have to fall into the black hole. So there's an orbit that that is the, the, the closest you can get and still orbit around the black hole is about three times that Schwarzschild radius. If you're orbiting a spinning black hole and going in the opposite direction, you're out at about 10 Schwarzschild radii. And if you're orbiting with the black hole, you can snuggle up right to the very event horizon itself about one Schwarzschild radii away. And, and, with this, and, and I don't, the only thing I want you to take away from this graph here is that for the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy that I'll tell you about in a second, the orbital period is minutes. So it weighs four million times the mass of our sun, but you can move around it in four minutes, right? So it's an extraordinarily fast orbit. So we are trying to do two things with the Event Horizon Telescope project. We are trying to see the black hole, but we're also looking to find these orbits of matter moving around the black hole. Now, uh, a postdoc of mine, Hotaka Shiokawa, made this wonderful simulation it really shows you what you would see, not only if you could be at the black hole, but if you had a movie camera. And you see this, this silhouette here, which is the last photon orbit, and you see the hot gas moving around the black hole. So the, the, light, the gravitational lensing that somebody, I think, called out earlier in the front row here uh, is being seen in spades here, right? So you see um, that uh, the light is being bent in a full circle around the black hole. Now, the best chance we have of taking a picture of a black hole is right in our own backyard. It's the center of, of our galaxy where there's a four million solar mass black hole called Sagittarius A star. And you see here tendrils of super hot gas falling into the center of the galaxy. This little dot right here is radio emission from what we think is a four million solar mass black hole. How do we know how much it weighs? Because optical astronomers have seen stars orbiting an unseen mass, right? Look at this one right here. You see a star executing a full orbit around a black hole. As I like to say, this really should knock your socks off, OK? And if it doesn't, you're, you're wearing some very tight socks, right? I mean, nowhere else in the universe will you see something tossing a star around like a planet. It's really remarkable. And we've actually seen it here. And, and you don't even see this in the optical. All you know is that there's something making that star move around it, right? And it has to be about four million times the mass of our sun. So as they say, so you want to photograph a black hole, kid, how are you going to do that? Well, the magnifying power required is incredible. We've got to zoom in by a factor of 100,000 beyond that image I just showed you with the tendrils of gas falling in. Now, the smallest size you can see on the sky, this is the only equation I'm going to have in my whole talk, and I wish it had hydrogen bombs in it, like Peter's do, did, but it doesn't. So, oop, so the smallest thing you can see on the sky is basically the wavelength of light you're observing divided by the telescope size. Now, we, for the Event Horizon Telescope work I'm going to tell you about, we have to use radio waves. And the wavelength is about one millimeter, about just, just like that. So that's kind of fixed. So when you, whoop, so when you say you need a, that kind of wavelength, you calculate the telescope size, and you see, well, the size of that black hole in the center of the galaxy is about 50 micro arc seconds. What's that like? That's like being able to see an orange on the moon. Okay? Or if you play golf, it's like being able to count the dimples on a golf ball in Los Angeles while we're standing here in Boston. Okay? So we need to assemble a telescope that has the greatest magnifying power ever conceived. And we have to also have to see through the Earth's atmosphere, all the dreck, all the interstellar gas between us and the center of the galaxy, and also the hot gas that 100 billion degree gas near the center of the galaxy, which is able to see through that too. So we have to use radio waves to see through all of that. And we need a telescope that's 10,000 kilometers across. Whoa. OK, so how are we going to do that? This is another thing you can't go to true value and get, right? <laughs> Neutronium and 10,000 kilometer wide telescopes, two things it's very, very hard to get. So a single telescope just won't do. OK, the way a single telescope works, of course, is that all these incoming waves bounce off this nice parabolic reflector, bounce to the receiver where you collect them all. But we, can nev we could never make a 10,000 kilometer wide dish like that. So this is where VLBI comes in, very long baseline interferometry. So what we do, essentially, 
is link together radio dishes across the surface of the Earth with a network of atomic clocks. So we can synchronize them to fractions of a nanosecond. We record data on hard disk drives at each of those telescopes. And we essentially freeze the light. So instead of having a parabola mirror that bounces the, the light off the parabola mirror where it combines geometrically at the focus, we freeze the light, we bring it back to a supercomputer that's about 30 miles north of here at MIT's Haystack Observatory, and we play it back. And we merge those recordings, and we wind up with a data set as though we had a telescope as big as the distance between the dishes that we're using to record the data. This is really cool stuff. Right? <laughs> I got involved in this about 20 years ago when we were using reel-to-reel -reel recorders and video recorders and things like this. And now, of course, we've gone totally digital. We've let Moore's Law do all the work for us. So instead of developing a lot of the instrumentation we use, we go and order it from Amazon or Newegg and we stitch it together. And what we do is we write custom software and custom firmware to make it do very, very extraordinary things. And we record everything on hard disk drives, right? So we record about 64 gigabits per second. We record about 10 petabytes per observing session, which is many, many libraries of Congress. So one of the sites that we use is South Pole Telescope. And people say to me, well, why don't you just send it back by the internet? It would take 24 years for us to send all the data back from the South Pole in order to make our pictures. So nothing beats the bandwidth of a 747 packed with disk drives, it turns out. <laughs> and and, and each, of these, each of these bays is, has got eight disks in them, and we have about 10 terabytes per disk, so it's about 80 terabytes. When I hold two of them in my hand and I walk down the hallway, that's the fastest internet on the planet. <laughs> okay, it beats hands down, any internet you can get in your house or even almost commercially. Um, so what we did was we looked at the center of the galaxy with a test array. We linked telescopes in Hawaii, California, and Arizona, and we looked at this black hole. Now, remember, the, 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 the angular uh, size of something on the sky you can see with a telescope depends on, it, on the telescope size. The bigger the telescope, the smaller the object you can see. So, on this baseline here, when we connected these two telescopes, we had a sensitivity on the sky about like this. Okay, just bear with me for a moment. So the black hole was all contained in that region that we were sensitive to. We expected all the energy of the black hole to be seen when we compared the recordings between here and here. But now on these long baselines, right, we're sensitive to a much smaller region. So if the black hole had a finite size, if the black hole was like a disk, the short baseline sees all the energy, and the, sh and, the sh and the long baseline would see only a fraction of that energy. We're excluding some of the energy of the black hole because our beam is so tight. We're looking at very small features. And that is exactly what we saw. It's really extraordinary. This is power we see, and this is the length of the distance between the telescopes. On the short baseline, we saw all the energy we expected to see, the maximum energy. But on the long baseline to Hawaii from the continental United States, we saw only a fraction of the energy. I really wish that everybody sometime in their career experiences a moment like this. You're at your computer, you've spent a long time trying to find something, and you see this. And that is kind of a eureka moment. That's when you jump out of the bathtub, right? And you're like, my god, I figured out how like, water dis is displaced, right? I mean, this is, this is really incredible. Right? We saw for the first time the size of a black hole. And the size we got was about four Schwarzschild radii across, which is exactly what we think the shadow feature should be. Right? Because the gravity of the black hole bends light, right? And so we expect, the, we expect the size of that shadow to be exactly about five Schwarzschild radii. We saw something very, very close to that. That let us know that we were onto something. That let us know that with this technique, we could not only size the black hole, but if we built out more telescopes, we could make an image of it. And that's what the Event Horizon Telescope Project is all about. So what I've showed you so far is what happens on this triad of telescopes, right? But now we've added a telescope in Mexico, We've added telescopes in Chile. We have two telescopes in Europe. And we even have now detections 
to a telescope at the south pole of the Earth. Uh, and we're, and we're, and we're I, I think we should be going to Greenland too, but well, it'll be there next year. But one of the things I want to tell you about is that the, the, the telescope in Chile is actually a multiple telescopes, right? It's up on the high Atacama plane. And the interesting thing about this telescope is that it, when you add up all this collecting area, it's so big that it's the crown jewel, really, of the Event Horizon Telescope. And we only just got this done last year. So last year was the first time the Event Horizon Telescope lit up all those sites that I just showed you. Now, you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute. You've got a telescope here. You've got a telescope here, one here. Yes, you've got a virtual mirror that's the size of the Earth. But isn't there a lot of open space in between? How do you fill in that virtual mirror? And the answer is right under your feet. The Earth rotates, right? So as you're looking at the galactic center, all these interconnecting webs of the telescopes that are linked together with those atomic clocks synchronizing them sweep out a, a spider web of reflective material. So you weave together a whole virtual telescope over the course of an evening. You add up all of those data points, and that gives you a virtual mirror that is filled in. And that is what lets us make images. So we think that if this is what the black hole looks like, uh, without ALMA, it's very, we can make the si we can find out the size of the black hole, but we can't really see that event horizon. With ALMA, we expect to get this kind of image. Now, these are simulations. I want to be very clear. We have not yet taken this picture. We have the data, and we're still crunching the data as we speak. But this is what led us on this merry chase, right? We realized that we could make this kind of image, and uh, we should be looking at the data and finishing the number crunching sometime this year. So stay tuned. Now, one of the things that we do when we've tried to make images is we have to make sure that we're really looking at what we think we're looking at. So what we did was we went to our whole team and we said, okay, you guys think you can make images of black holes. And we made synthetic data. We made fake data of black holes. And we gave them all a chance to make images. So this is, these are six realizations of a bunch of fake data. And they did a pretty good job because that was the image that we used to generate that fake data. So this is pretty good news, right? Well, all of all, the whole team is able to make pretty good and consistent images when we give them fake data. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes it's not so easy for all these different algorithms to converge, and that's because we gave them a much more complicated image, okay? Because we don't know what we're gonna see. So we're always perfecting and refining these ways of developing, if you will, the film of the Event Horizon Telescope. And then we gave them this. I think I heard somebody say what this actually is. Of course, this is frosty, right? Because you never know what could be in the center of our galaxy. It could be Frosty the Snowman, right? And, and this is really, this, is, this was actually quite, um, quite reassuring because people didn't try to make a black hole looking object, right? They said, well, it's gotta be something like this. And there were a bunch of people who culturally didn't know anything about Frosty, right? There we have a whole group of people in Japan who are busy working on these algorithms, and they were like, what is Frosty? We have no idea what Frosty is, right? So even they were like, oh, it looks like it's got a body and a head, and little stick arms and everything. Now this is really important because when you're trying to image something that you don't know what it is, you can run into a lot of problems. So you try to get a computer to tell the difference between a labradoodle and fried chicken, okay? It is really, really hard. And if you think that labradoodles and fried chicken are virtually indistinguishable, wait till you see chihuahuas and blueberry muffins. I mean, I don't know about you guys, I just wanna take a big bite out of this one, right? Anyway, so the moral of the story is you want to be really careful. You want to double and triple check everything. You don't want to see a chihuahua where there's really a blueberry muffin and vice versa. Right. Okay. Now, in addition to making images, we can also test for those orbits I was telling you about. And for that, you don't even need to make an image. Right? You can just have three stations, and what you're seeing, whoop, and what you're seeing here is a hot spot orbiting the black hole. So imagine you have an accretion disk or a pancake of material orbiting around the black hole and there's a hot spot in it. 
then what you see here is that if you have a telescope in Chile, in California, and Hawaii, you wind up getting a data set that without even making an image, but putting on a, on a strip chart recorder, like an EKG, like a heart monitor, you would see, you can tell the heartbeat, if you will, of the center of our galaxy by looking at just the raw data. So we're hoping to do this kind of trick as well. So in addition to making an image of that silhouette, also trying to time the orbits around the black hole, two totally different ways of testing Einstein. Einstein told us what the shape of the shadow should be, but he also told us what the period of those orbits should be. And what you can see here is that here's the normal picture, that gray area. And if you have a hot spot that orbits around the black hole, and here it is even behind the black hole, never try to hide behind a black hole, by the way. There is no behind the black hole, right? So if, you're, if this is the black hole and I'm behind it, light rays from me go up over the black hole. So what you're seeing here is light from behind the black hole going coming up and over. And this shows you how well we can do. So the red line here shows the model of what we think we would see with an orbiting hot spot around the black hole. And these salt and pepper points are, are a simulation where we actually put the real noise in from our systems, from the Event Horizon Telescope. And you can see that with the first kind of data we expect to get, we should be able to follow that curve pretty well. And as we improve things, it'll get even better. So we think that we'll be able to make two tests, not only imaging the black hole, but also timing orbits around the black hole as well. Now, I'm really happy to say that things worked. So in April 2017, these are the data that we're still working on now, we got wall-to-wall -wall detections. Every site that I showed you before on the globe worked very, very well. And as an example, you see Chile to the South Pole. I'm not going to go into what this means, but this peak here is indication that everything worked very, very well. Uh, I know, it's like... It's like, this is, one of those, this is one of those slides where it's like, I know, I can tell you every one of these things right over here. But the important thing is that it really did work, and it was, it was really remarkable. Uh, we have a big, what's that? Big group. It's a big group. Yeah, we have about 200 people in the Event Horizon Telescope um, collaboration. And, and I just want to point out that it is really a great joy and privilege to work with all of these people. So there are theorists who sit with pads of paper and pencils and and supercomputers to figure out what black holes should look like. There are observers in here that go to the South Pole, that go to the top of mountains to carry out these observations. And I want to point out that to test the most extreme environments, sometimes we have to go to pretty extreme places ourselves. Right? We go to 15,000 feet where lack of oxygen causes what we call summit moments. Right? So you're up at 15,000 feet and there's no oxygen up there. And all of a sudden, you're thinking to yourself, why am I here? Like, what am I doing? I, I had this one moment where I was up on a ladder screwing something in, and people down below were like, what is taking you so long? And I was like, I don't know. It is really difficult <laughs> to screw this thing in. And, and it wasn't until about a few minutes later I realized I was trying to unscrew it. Right? I was just going the wrong way. I was like righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. You know, I, I couldn't figure that out. Right? So you've got to be very careful. And that's why we have a group of people here at sea level. So whenever we observe, we have a sea level crew that can be called upon at a moment's notice to give us expert advice when we're up <laughs> at altitude. But, but a wonderful team of people here. Uh, we also get a lot of, of, of uh, support from institutions and funding agencies. I want to point that out. Um, here's some of the team. Here's a group at South Pole. Uh, they're working in very, very cold conditions, about minus 40 Fahrenheit. And if you're trying to do the conversion, minus 40 Fahrenheit's really easy. Minus 40 Celsius, right? <laughs> So uh, you know about exactly how cold it is. Um, here's one of our graduate students adjusting the atomic clock in Mexico. Uh, here's a group of people uh, also in Mexico. This is with the big dish on the top of uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra Negra, which is at 15,000 feet. Uh, these are people of the Atacama Plains in, at Alma. This is at 16,500 feet. Um, these are people in Pico Valida, Spain, uh, about 11,000 feet in the mountains of southern Spain. Uh, and this is Hawaii, if you can imagine that. This is the one place, one, one of the only places in the world where you can be skiing and surfing within the same hour. Okay, so this is at uh, 14,000 feet at the summit of Mauna Kea. And these dishes you see behind here are, are the submillimeter ray that's run by the Smithsonian, which is where we are right now. So this is a simulation done in 1979 by Jean-Pierre Luminet. 
He sat down and went through all the calculations to figure out what a pancake of orbiting material would look like around a black hole, and he saw this shadow here. And what's really remarkable about this image is that he hand-painted it on negative paper, right? So he, he, in a point, he's very French, right? So it, it, was, all, it was all pointillist. And he, with, a, with a little paintbrush, he, point, he painted this all pixel by pixel. And then many, many years later, Kip Thorne and an army of CGI people came up with basically the same image for interstellar. And, and we're hoping with the Event Horizon Telescope to, at some point, turn these conceptions and calculations into reality and make the first image of a black hole. And we're not resting even there. We want to make movies of a black hole. So this is what we're doing right now with uh, some of the sites around the world. But if we add many, many more sites, we can use special digital signal processing techniques to make movies of how things are orbiting around the black hole. So this is one of the things we want to do in the future. So if anybody has a spare atomic clock in their <laughs> attic, maybe, uh, antique roadshow kind of situation, uh, please let me know, because we can uh, uh, deploy it somewhere. And then we're, we're not even resting on the Earth. We're looking now to expand the Event Horizon Telescope into space. So what you see here in magenta um, are all the baseline pairs for telescopes you might see on the Earth. But if you add an orbiting telescope that circles the Earth every 90 minutes or so, you can really fill in that virtual mirror very, very quickly. And it turns out that if you have this kind of, uh, of black hole, this is what you would see only with the Earth baselines. When you go into space, you can really see beautifully that, uh, that event horizon. So this is kind of where we're going uh, in the future. Now, if you want to follow us uh, and get updates, uh, and we're usually we're pretty good with this, uh, I encourage you to go to the Event Horizon Telescope website. We have a Facebook page, and occasionally we also tweet. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we hope to have some uh, results to show you in the very near future. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a great question. We think they do. But at this point, we're pretty convinced that every galaxy has at its center a supermassive black hole, millions or billion times the mass of our sun. And we think they evolve together. So it's not clear which came first, the black hole or the galaxy, but they seem to evolve in a symbiotic way. And different galaxies will merge together. They'll crash. All the gas and dust will be on a shock wave and will collapse to the center and make an even bigger black hole. So black holes tend to build by hierarchy in that way. Right. Are there more black holes oh. than a galaxy? Um, well, so there's usually only one supermassive black hole, but there are many, many smaller black holes that occur through stellar evolution. So a lot of the heavier mass stars that we see will undergo supernova, and they'll you know, black holes will be born from those. Um, so when you say like a large or a supermassive black hole, you're only referring to the actual mass and not the volume, right? Well, that's a great question. Um, you can think of it in a couple different ways. The singularity, right, where all the mass has been scrunched together, that can be any mass you want. Right? That, that, that's the terrifying power of black holes, right? The, the reason that black holes can do what they do is that you can get as close as you want to them. Right? So if I drop something, I'm not going to drop anything because I'll break it, but if I drop something on the Earth, You'll hear it clatter, but it stops at the surface of the Earth. Right? So the amount of energy it can liberate is limited. But when you allow something to continue to accelerate all the way in, it can approach the speed of light. And that is the secret sauce of the black hole. That's why it can liberate so much energy, because when that smacks into the other matter that's also trying to get into the black hole, it gets very, very hot, heats up to billions, hundreds of billions of degrees. So you can make a black hole as massive as you want, and then the event horizon just scales with the mass, right? So if you have a black hole that's a billion solar masses, it'll have a much larger event horizon where the force of gravity stops light from escaping than a million solar mass black hole. And that's the volume that you might be talking about. So the, the black hole in the center of our galaxy has kind of an event horizon that fits in the orbit of Mercury. But there's another one we look at that's six billion solar masses. 
And that event horizon is kind of the size of our solar system, if that puts it in perspective. In the front? Yeah. Um, I was a little uh, confused by the difference between the event horizon and the black hole's shadow. If the, if the black hole's shadow with the edge, the silhouette, is the, is the lowest stable photon orbit, that means by definition that any orbit below that will force the photon to spiral in. But if the definition of the swoosh field radius is the radius below which nothing, not even light, can escape, and the definition of the black hole's shadow is the lowest orbit at which the photons can escape, then wouldn't those be the same thing? I know I'm wrong, please correct me. No, 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 no that's, a, that's a fantastic question. So, so I, I want to like piece that together. So you're right, the, the, the event horizon is the point where if light is trying to get radially outward, it can't do that anymore, right? Because if light really wants to escape, it doesn't want to go at an angle to the black hole. It wants to get directly away from the black hole, right? So the, the event horizon is a little smaller than the orbital radius. Right, because the, that, that's where you're circularized around the black hole. Does that make a little sense? Okay, and and then it's even it gets even more complicated because light is bent around the black hole. You've got this orbital ring, and light from that ring, if it came right to you, like if, if this is the black hole, if it came right to you, it would cross like this because the gravity of the black hole if it was here it would force light to go around it like this. So what you actually see is the light that goes away from the black hole and then comes to you. So the size of the shadow we see is about five times the size of the event horizon. It's like those mirrors you see in cars that say objects and mirror are closer than they appear. <laughs> That's what the black hole does, right? It, it is, it, it's its own magnifying glass, right? It makes itself like a puffer fish. It makes itself like look really big because it's bending light in a way that makes it look larger than it really is. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. A right. different and kind of slightly silly question. No, no silly question. <laughs> if a low, if the reason that a low Earth orbit satellite would be preferable, you know, is because it's not forced to orbit, to rotate around the Earth at the same rate as the other telescopes, so you can get a lot more varied lines. Mm -hmm. uh, then. Would it not be even more preferable to put the telescope in a, in a point that can fit even more lines, perhaps like a language point or even another c celestial body? Uh, th th that's a great point. Uh, if you want to quickly fill in the virtual mirror, then you want a low Earth orbit because that is the fastest, that's the smallest period, right? If you go farther away, then it's going to, in geos in, for instance, in geosynchronous orbit, it would be the same as the surface of the Earth. Well, right. I know that geosynchronous orbits the same as the field. Yeah. I'm talking about points that have even more erratic movement patterns relative to the surface of the Earth. Oh, that's an interesting question. I have to think about what those are. Um, what I can tell you is that there's a problem going too far. I mean, you know, you, what do they say? You can't be too rich or too thin or something like that. But <laughs> so, so you, you, you would think that, oh, the, the bigger the baseline, the better. It turns out that because Einstein's theory predicts the certain size, if you go too long, if your baseline is too big, if your magnifying power is too much, you can over-resolve things and you don't see anything, right? It's kind of like, I can see this bottle where I am now, but if I go really close like this, I can't really tell what I'm looking at, right? If, if you have too much magnifying power and the thing doesn't change in size, then you can over-resolve it and you don't see actually what you're looking at. So if, if, for example, you put a telescope on a moon of Jupiter, right, you wouldn't see anything left, right? It would, there would be nothing left to look at because you'd be kind of looking at a, a feature that is too big for you to see. That makes it make sense. Right. You've been very patient up there. Uh -huh. yeah. is, are all quasars black holes and are all, are, are all black holes quasars? Uh, the first one, yes. The second one, no. <laughs> so, so all quasars are supermassive black holes, we think. Right? Those are the very, very bright cores of galaxies. And the only thing that we know of that can power those quasars are supermassive black holes, matter falling onto them. 
But there are some black holes that aren't quasars, of course. They're just smaller black holes. Uh, or they're black holes that aren't being fed. So for example, the, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, thank God it's on a starvation diet, right? <laughs> because if it weren't, we'd be in a lot of trouble, right? Imagine we were in the crosshairs of one of those jets that, that Peter was showing us or that I showed you, right? We'd be vaporized, we'd be toast, right? So it's really a good thing that our particular black hole is just eating like, timidly, okay? Um, the quasars are black holes that are voracious eaters, that are, have, are being supplied with a lot of gas and dust, and they glow very, very brightly. Uh, what's the life cycle of black holes, and do they die? Well, you, you, you heard my animal husbandry remark. Right? Um, <laughs> the life cycle of a black hole. Well, a, when a, once a black hole is born, and it's of appreciable size, it just keeps growing. It's very, very difficult for a black hole to lose mass. So if it's in a symbiotic orbit with another star, it can start to rob that star of all of its material. Right? And those turn into x-ray binaries, and you can see them in the x-ray using Chandra that, that Peter talked about, or other wavelengths. Um, however, you've heard of Stephen Hawking. Yes. So Stephen Hawking was a great inspiration for our project and for a lot of astronomers and physicists across the globe. And we were very sorry yeah, at his passing. And, but his, his spirit of adventure and, and scholarship really survives in the EHT and other projects. He famously showed that matter could escape from the black hole, that over long, long periods of time, through quantum fluctuations at the boundary of the black hole, black holes could evaporate. It takes a long time for it to happen, but black holes do at some point radiate away in energy form all the matter that fell into them. So we probably won't be around to see the first black hole evaporate, and that's why Stephen Hawking famously said he was never going to win a Nobel Prize. Right? <laughs> because he said, well, I thought of this great thought. No one's ever going to be around to see it. You know? um, maybe he knows what's going on now. I don't know. Um, but but uh, black holes are probably not the prisons, uh, the eternal prisons that we once thought they were. Does uh, that evaporation have to exceed the rate that it's absorbing matter for, the, for it to disappear? Or? Yeah, so it would have to be a naked black hole, right? So if, if the black hole were accreting at all, if, if, if matter was falling out of the black hole, it, it would always exceed the rate of evaporation, right? So you have to have a black hole out in the nowhere where it's not absorbing any gas or dust or things like that. Then it could evaporate over time. In the front. Um, how specifically would it take like billions and billions of years? That's my first question. And my second question is, will the universe even still be around when the uh, black hole evaporates? I think, I think by the time that Hawking radiation is important, there will only be black holes. Yeah, so, so, yeah. It's, so it turns out that... It's, it's, it's much, much longer than the, the, the time of the, the age of the universe. Um, yeah, it's a long... I don't, I don't know if the numbers are, it's like 10 to the well, 50 or 10 to the 100, I think. It's really yeah, the universe has been around for about 13 billion years. It's kind of a long time. Yeah. Um, it, it would take significantly longer than that for even stellar mass black holes to evaporate. So this is not going to happen anytime, anytime soon. Well, what, what happened, uh, 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 weirdly enough, the bigger the black hole is, the... Sh the, the um, Less amount of time. No, actually the opposite. The, 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 the bigger the black hole, the lower the rate of evaporation. So it starts off really, really slowly. And then when it gets smaller and smaller, the rate of, the rate of radiation coming off of it increases exponentially. What? Right? So what you're saying is there's a runaway thing where it gets really, really, really tiny, then it's poof, it's gone. It goes by the surface area. So yeah, so teeny tiny black holes, if they existed, then they could be, yeah, the, the Hawking radiation could be witnessed in, in principle, but maybe they just don't exist. The people look for that.
That's a really interesting question. So you're saying, could we wait for one of those stars that orbits the black hole to go behind it, and then kind of see the ring of light behind it? It's a very interesting question. So, so it turns out that the kind of technique that we use, this very long baseline interferometry, can only really look at a very, very bright emission. Uh, that's why we can see the 100 billion degree gas that's around the black hole. The stars, as you probably know, are just maybe 5,000 degrees or 10,000 degrees. They're just not hot enough for us to see with this particular technique. Um, but, but people do look at those kinds of gravitational lenses uh, in the optical and the radio. But for right around the black hole, that's much harder to do. But I like the way you're thinking. That's, that's what we do. We think of new things all the time. Uh, okay. So, how do you know where these telescopes are pointing? And in particular, the, the curve you showed that had the energy of the whole black hole, and then the high resolution, which is the little fractional black hole. Mm -hmm. How do you know you just weren't not aimed at the black hole? And so, the yeah, that, that, so that, that's, that's a great question. So, it turns out that the, uh, the angular resolution was a magnifying power of a single dish, like one, one of the dishes, like in Chile or in Hawaii or something like that, is big enough that it's very, very easy to point on the black hole, right? Because the black hole is basically a dot. The black hole is yeah. basically a point source for one of those single dishes, yeah. right? But it's very, very easy to know that you're kind of pointed up on that. Because you go a little bit over this way, you see the energy come down. Yeah. You go over this way, the energy comes down. So it's pretty easy to point up on that. It's only, you only get that high magnifying power when you combine, when you play back yeah. the recordings you made in Chile with the recordings you made in Hawaii, right? Only when you play them back together do you wind up getting a data set as though you had a telescope as big as the distance between Chile and Hawaii. And that's where you can start to piece together the structure of the black hole on really, really small scales. So, you, so the, the it, it, it's easy to get all the telescopes pointing at the same place at the same time. And then, yeah, it's quite easy to do that. So, yeah. And when you add them together, do you have to maintain phase coherence between all those different sources from so far away? And at, at what, what sample rate do you, and I know, I, 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 <laughs> Well, we, we, you know, let's get wonky. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's, let's, let's roll up our sleeves. So, so, so it turns out that everything you are talking about is of great importance and significance to us. Um, we have to use atomic clocks at all of the sites. Because, so, so imagine you had like a, a sinusoid, like a waveform that looks like this, coming from the black hole. Just imagine you had this, and you recorded it here in Chile. And it looks like this, like ups and downs. And you record the same thing over here in I don't know, Spain. First of all, you have to make really, really stable recordings. Otherwise, when you bring them together, they're vibrating back and forth like this, right? And you can never tell whether you're matching or not. The atomic clocks let us do that. The atomic clocks let us make rock solid recordings. Then when we bring them back together 30 miles north of here, we play them back and we find out right where they match. So we do effectively get phase coherence across 10,000 kilometer distances by doing this, right? But it's only because we use very, very stable clocks and it's only because we have enough signal to noise ratio or enough signal that we can make this comparison. And that was that big peak I showed you. Remember I said, is this like graph that I'm not going to explain too much about? Right? <laughs> so basically you can look at it this way. When, when you're off, when you're not aligned up, you're at the low point of that graph. And as soon as, you, as soon as my fingers lie on top of each other, you get that big spike. And that's how we knew that we were seeing the same photons from the black hole in Spain as we were in the South Pole. It's kind of remarkable that photons picked up in Spain actually know something about the photons that were detected in Hawaii. Well, uh, the black holes you've been talking about have been caused by conventional matter. There's this dark matter that seems to be holding galaxies together. Is there any interaction there? Is there any, uh, do they interact at all? Do, um, what's going on? Whoa, that, <laughs> are you talking to me? <laughs> First of all, I'm flattered. Uh, so it, it, it's a great question. There's a, uh, I mean, basically, I, I would, let me just say that there are two big mysteries in the universe as far as I'm concerned. 
and your mileage may vary. <laughs> Thought is one of the great mysteries. Yeah, how do a bunch of atoms get together in our bodies and kind of have a thought? That is amazingly bizarre and mind-blowing, okay? The second is black holes, right? <laughs> and and, and the, the thing is that black holes are mysterious. They're the, the, the most mysterious things in the sky that I know of because no matter what they're made of, dark matter, Hello Kitty dolls, <laughs> gravel, you know, dump trucks, my Apple, old Apple computers, once they go into the event horizon, you can't tell what went into it. Okay, so they could be dark matter. Dark matter may have fed these black holes. It's, it's almost impossible, in fact, it is impossible to really know what went in there. Now, the dark matter that we think holds together galaxies because of the rotation curves of galaxies. We see galaxies rotate and we say, there has to be more matter in there than we can see with, our, with the optical light. Um, we don't quite know what that's made of yet. Nobody really knows. It seems not to interact too much with normal matter. But one thinks and one imagines that if it went through the event horizon, the black hole would increase in size and in mass. So uh, it, it would be, have to be pulled in by the gravity of the black hole, right? Yep. The well, well, contact of the black hole would have to pull the dark matter, whatever it is, into it. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but dark matter does. It, we know about gravity. it by by gravity. Yeah, because that, that's how we see it. It's yeah. affecting it's affecting the rotation curves normal. of galaxies. Yeah. It doesn't tend to pump as much as normal matter, so you don't. You'll get some dark matter in a black hole, but not as much as uh, normal. Right. We've got two enthusiastic hands up here, so we've got time just for two more questions. Uh, um, but if dark matter is in the um, in the black hole, then wouldn't we not have had a necessary reason to know that dark matter would have to exist? Because then the black hole would have sufficient matter to hold the parts of the galaxy in the orbit. Um, can you say that one more one more time? <laughs> so, like, if the dark matter that would be necessary for like the objects in the galaxy to like go in the orbit. But if that dark matter was sucked into the black hole, then wouldn't there not have been a reason for us to need to, to like know that dark matter had to exist? Oh, I see. Um, so I, I guess I would answer that by saying that whatever dark matter may have fallen into the black hole, we wouldn't tell the we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that and normal matter. Um, but what, what we do know, you know, this other your the gentleman's question was that we do know there has to be dark matter outside of the black hole because we see that rotation curves very far from the black hole um, need something else. They need this dark matter. So some dark matter may have fallen into the black hole, but it's not like that explains everything. You, you, in other words, you can't explain the rotation curves of galaxies just by the point mass at the center of the galaxy. You have to have this distributed dark matter all throughout the galaxy. So it may be a combination of both. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> Last question. Okay, so um, how how does how does a black hole increase or decrease in size if it has an infinite um, density, like you said? Oh. Because that, if it has an infinite density and it's absorbing matter, the matter should come in, but it shouldn't really change, like the size. It shouldn't make it bigger because. It so you, you've, so yeah, you've, you've caught me out on that. Um, but our little game of chess continues, right? So, uh, uh, the, uh, so the singularity at the center. First of all, we don't really know what happens inside the event horizon. Okay, nobody really knows. If anybody tells you they know what they know what happens inside an event horizon, they're lying to you, right? But what we do know is that. Uh, in theory, when matter falls in, it just adds to that point of infinite density. It's just that there's more mass there. Okay? So that, you're right, that doesn't change in size. It's still a singularity. What does change in size is the event horizon. Because since there's more matter in there, the point at which the gravity is so strong that light can't escape goes out a little ways. Oh. Does that make yes. sense? Yeah. Right? And so the shadow gets bigger because the event horizon is bigger, and so the light coming from the last photon orbit is also farther out. Mm -hmm. So that, that's why a four million solar mass black hole has an event horizon that's the size of, within the orbit of Mercury, but a six billion solar mass black hole has an event horizon that's the size of the solar system.
So the, so the black hole itself isn't getting bigger, but the event horizon is getting bigger. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. itself isn't getting bigger with the event horizon is getting bigger.